Uh, I am pleased to be able to speak at you <laughs> for the next uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes or so. Um, like Ken said, I'm Matt Bowers, and uh, this presentation is, we're going to talk about a couple different things. We're going to talk about um, certification, certification costs, and things like that. And then we're going to get into some general tips and tricks, some of the more common errors and things that, that I see as a certifier um, when it comes to uh, your energy models and things. Um, I am coming to you live from Rochester, New York, uh, inside my own passive house. And this right here is my, my plaque on my, the front of my house. Um, it was a really, really exciting and, and certainly a, uh, an education, uh, pro educational process to go through the certification. And it was actually that process that inspired me to become a certifier. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about the process. Now, the process is going to vary a little bit based on uh, the size of the project. The, the process is going to be different, obviously, for a 200-unit multifamily building than it would be for a single-family house, um, just because the, the overall design process uh, isn't iterated as many times. So for a, for a typical project, what we'll normally see is the, uh, the architectural team, the design team, is going to come up with their SD set. And with that, the passive house consultant is going to bring up a real rough PHPP, the, the passive house planning package model. And then they can send it off to a certifier. At that point, there's usually enough information where you can get a quote from a certifier. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then the certifier can then just do a quick once over. On the, on the PHPP just to make sure that some general assumptions are, are correct. And usually at that stage, the certifier um, is able to do a little bit of guidance uh, towards maybe we don't need the 10 inches of EPS insulation under your slab, right? Because this assumption and this assumption are a little, are a little too conservative. Um, so the, the passive house certifier can certainly weigh in on things like that. And then once the initial check is good, then the design team can begin uh, construction documents or, or uh, design development. Um, and then the passive house consultant will then continue um, updating the PHPP and doing their design optimization and selecting final um, uh, components, windows and ventilation systems and heating and cooling equipment, domestic hot water stuff. And then the, all of that information is then sent to the certifier for a design, uh, design assurance letter. Okay. Where the certifier will say, okay, if this is built as designed, uh, it will meet passive house. Uh, it will meet the passive house classic or passive house plus or passive house premium, whatever the, the project is kind of going after. And then you kind of get the okay to go build it. And so that's where the, the builder and tradesman and, and, um, and the consultant or whoever's doing the QAQC is going to uh, take over and photo documentation and, and all of those other things, as well as slight design changes. You know, we're gonna change the window installation detail to this and, and you know, whatever updates are made at that point. And then all of that information is sent to the certifier after the final blower door test is done and after the ventilation system is commissioned and the certifier okays all of it and goes ahead and um, sends the plaque out. Okay. Um, now one thing that I should note is by engaging the certifier this early in the process. Okay. Um, we can make sure, or the certifier can make sure to notify the team if there are, um, extra photos that they might want, right. A certifier is going to send a list of photos to the designer and to the, uh, the consultant 
of things that they would like to see photos of or things that they need to see photos of during construction. But if there are some odd, uh, if there are some odd uh, details and things, there might be some extra photos that we're going to want to see. So engaging the certifier early, they will be able to provide that feedback. Now, what does all of this cost? And what I will say is there is a cool little formula here that all of the certifiers are going to use. Uh, and I have to be honest, I stole this from an NAPHN conference in 2017 that was given by Tomas O'Leary from Passive House uh, Academy and Tad Everhart from Certifiers Cooperative. So I can't claim uh, that, that I came up with this formula because it's pretty creative. The first thing that we think about is going to be how well the consultant is organized, this O sub C, okay? We, we love formulas and, and formulas in, uh, in, our, in our Passive House Designer course, right? Um, how, how big of a pain in the butt is the designer gonna be, right? That's certainly something that we consider when we're pricing out our uh, proposal for consulting. What kind of products are you using? Crappy products are certainly going to increase the cost of a uh, of the certification, right? We prefer to see um, certified products. It makes our life a lot easier. But if you're going to use uncertified products, it's going to cost more just because of the extra time that it's going to take to pull together all of the information that we need to get. Terrible details. Terrible details are certainly going to drive up the cost of certification, okay? And terrible details, there, there's really two facets to this. This should almost be uh, T sub D squared because terrible details just to begin with, um, right? Aluminum flashing under your windows and all kinds of other crazy, silly details. And then if they're not even documented, right? We don't have enough details to go off of, that's gonna make things even worse, right? what's the door threshold detail over here because we have a risk of condensation. So um, making sure that your details are, are buttoned up is going to help lower the cost of certification. The never ending drip feed of information, that, uh, that is very, very challenging. There is a lot of information that we need to gather as certifiers. And if they are sent to us every two days, from a single email with one little attachment with a little note, it's going to get lost. Okay. So it, it takes just as long to stay up to date on a daily or weekly basis than it does just to have a standing monthly meeting with the certifier and say, okay, these are the changes. This is what we have. This is, um, this is where the project is. This is what we're considering. What are your thoughts? That is a much more efficient use of everyone's time than to send us a daily email with another PDF attachment, okay? And then finally, you gotta listen to our suggestions, right? The degree to which the consultant never listens to what's needed is certainly going to uh, impact the overall cost of certification. Bottom line, when we're giving a proposal for certification, it's 100% based on how much time we think it's gonna take to certify the building. And whatever the designer can do, to streamline that process is going to only lower the cost of certification. Okay, so that's why the, the first, the, the, first um, the first variable here is how well the consultant is organized, for sure. Now, I did harp a little bit on open lines of communication. So there really does need to be an open line of communication between the designer and the certifier. There is a lot of exchange of information. There is tracking of information to, to take uh, that needs to take place um, very early in the process. Um, you may have an idea for one window manufacturer and then halfway through, you're gonna change the window manufacturer. So now you've sent the certifier two different sets of window, uh, of window manufacturer information and we don't know what is what. So, um, being able to track those changes and keep the certifier up to date is very important, but not on a daily basis. Okay, uh, sending progress calculations, model updates, and other supporting documents will get lost over email, for sure. Um, you want to keep the certifier in the loop on major changes to the project. 
Um, and some of these quotes are actually quotes that I've heard from designers. Um, we've decided to change from a full basement to a slab on grade. And that's done. And the, and the permit set has been issued. Here's the model, right? And so the certifier doesn't have a chance to comment on those potential changes. We've just received our delivery of windows. How do I get the information to update the PHPP because these windows aren't certified? The window manufacturer said it would be okay. Um, that's not something that the certifier wants to hear. Uh, tracking down window, non-certified window information is a pain in the butt and will take four times longer than you think it ever possibly could. Um, it's just, it's really incredible. Um, we did our blower door test yesterday and need you to finish the certification by the end of the week so that we can have the project certified by the end of the year for tax purposes. That's not going to fly. Um, to turn around a certification is usually going to take a minimum of two or three weeks with notification. Okay, we've got a lot of checking the photos, we've got a lot of checking of documents to do. And um, so just keep keep that in mind that we just can't drop everything. Most certifiers are working on up to 30 projects at once. So um, keeping them up to date, but not necessarily on a daily basis is going to be very important. So the question is, how do we do this? Right? Um, a lot of certifiers have their own methods. And the one that I have found most useful is the actual certification portal. And so what the certifier does is creates this, uh, this account for the designer and for the certifier to communicate. And this is right on PHI's website. Okay. And it's got some really cool information. So right at the top of this portal, we've got all of the project information. And actually this is the project uh, set up for my house with Passive House Academy, um, who certified my house. So this has got the project information. And then we've got a nice little dialogue bar where you can send little emails. This is where you would send those one line email updates to different things so that they're all in one place. They're not buried in a string of, of emails with a bunch of replies. This is a good place to, to have that dialogue with the certifier. There's a cool little process bar so that you have an idea of where the certifier is in reviewing your project, okay? And at the bottom here, there's a checklist and I'm gonna click ahead here in just a second, but this checklist will give you a green check mark, meaning the certifier has checked everything in that category and you have supplied all of the information that's needed. You are good to go. There are uh, some, some caution checks, the, the yellow checks, which means some of the information has been checked, not all of it. There's still some stuff that might need to be uh, looked at. And then the red checkbox is either going to be nothing has been uploaded to that uh, portion of the portal yet, or um, there's an issue with what has been submitted. Okay, so there's a nice little interactive checklist that will tell you what needs to be uploaded and whether or not the certifier has okayed it, okay? All right, so now what can the designer do to, um, to help lower the cost of certification? We kind of talked about this already. Um, use certified components where possible, okay? And be prepared for the extra work and cost if using uncertified stuff. And that extra work is gonna be on the designer and on the certifier. So it's not just extra work for the certifier, it's extra work for the designer as well. Most, mostly the designer. Um, to get the very best price, give the certifier as much information as possible, okay? Um, send them your PHPP, send them a drawing set, send them a design PH model if you're using design PH. Um, any markup that you've done on the print set are very, very helpful. This is going to kind of, it's kind of like an interview process, right? And it's going to show us how organized the project is and what we'll see, what, like an example of what we'll see when you submit us documents. So the more detailed the information and the better looking it is, we're going to understand that you, you got it together and you know what you're doing and you're organized and this is going to be a much smoother process. 
and be upfront with some of the items that you might need um, assistance with, right? Not every designer knows everything. And going through the Passive House Designer course isn't really going to prepare you to certify a project right after, the, after you pass the exam. Okay, there's a lot of extra help that's needed. And the certifier is more than willing to do that. Um, some of the common questions that we get is, how do you model heat pumps in PHPP? Um, we've got a vented range hood. How do, we, how do we model a vented range hood in PHPP? What are some considerations we need to have? Um, and maybe the most common question is, I, I don't, I've never done a thermal bridge calculation. How do I do a thermal bridge calculation? Can you help me with that? And so those are all items and more that the certifier can certainly help you with. Okay. Now, how can the certifier help? So the certifier can help by checking the PHPP early for initial errors. The earlier you engage the certifier, the better. Okay. Um, there have been projects, like I said earlier, um, that after an initial check, we've said, you don't need this much insulation under your slab, right? You can probably take two inches away and you'll still be, you'll still be meeting the criteria fairly comfortably. Um, so, in, you know, allowing the certifier to have that initial review can actually save the project some money. Um, the certifier is going to ensure that the project is on path for certification prior to the permit set being issued. So um, that's, that's a very helpful little check there. There are over, I'm guessing, over 10,000 inputs in PHPP. So the more... Um, you know, the more eyes you have on it and it's, you know, sometimes it takes, it takes a certifier to look through. I make mistakes in PHPP all the time. And so having someone else who, who is a, you know, independent third party to look it over is very, very helpful. Um, they can also issue a design assurance letter. There are some cities who are requiring a design, a design assurance letter in order for a permit to be pulled. So the certifier has the capability of doing that. Um, the, the certifier can also give the team a list of required photos prior to construction to make sure that everything is documented correctly. And so we've got, a, we've got our standard list of photos, but we can also give those photos of special details that, that might be specific to this project only. And then most importantly, we can answer that, how do I do this question, which I'm sure every designer has had and you don't know that you have it until you try to model it. Okay, and real quick, I'm just gonna talk about certified versus uncertified windows. Does everybody get a, get a theme here, an underlying theme with this? Um, if, it's, if you're using a certified window, life is good. Just enter the information from the certificate and you're done. If you are using an uncertified window, it, expect some extra work. There's gonna be extra modeling, okay? There is uh, the potential of adding a lot of extra components in the components tab. And all of those need to be cross-checked with how those components in the components tab are assigned in the windows tab. And that's extra time by the designer to make sure that that's all right. It's extra time by the designer to document on the print set how all of those are connected. And then that's extra time on the certifier to cross-check all of that information, okay? Um, and then we're talking about, there's gonna have to be a component for a standard frame, right? Your picture punch light window. Uh, there's gonna be an extra model for frame to frame windows for mullions, transoms, extra geometry, uh, installation psi values are gonna need to be uh, calculated. And maybe the, the biggest failure with using an uncertified window is the hygiene criteria, which is called FRSI. We wanna make sure that there are no condensation points. And usually an uncertified, not usually, many times, I guess that's the same as usually, um, this is where an uncertified window will not meet the criteria and we have to get really, really creative with how we're gonna install it. And by the time we go through that whole process, it would have been less expensive to use a certified window anyway. Um, we're gonna need to do extra glazing calculations and then we're gonna need to do the extra uh, PSI, I guess I said that already, the PSI install calculations. Okay, so this is all information that the designer must collect and model 
and then the certifier must check it and then probably recheck it after something wasn't supplied correctly. Okay, now that goes over briefly, really briefly, the certification process. So let's get into a few tips and tricks that myself and some other certifiers uh, use. Um, the wonderful thing about PHPP is it's Excel based. So it's very, very open source and you can, you can figure out exactly where everything is and where it's going. Um, there's no really hidden calculations. There are a lot of hidden calculations, but you can find them. You don't need to have a computer science degree or a computer engineering degree to find them. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm going through a PHPP is color code the cells showing, okay, this green cell, if it's green, I've checked it, I've verified it with the R values uh, cut sheet that was sent to me and we are good to use those values. Green means good, okay? Orange means I've got a question about it. And so you'll see here on this example, I have an orange cell for this quarter inch of airspace. Um, I don't, I didn't see that in the, uh, in the assembly that was sent to me. So I can add a comment to the cell and I do that frequently. You can see all of these red little comment uh, arrows. So use the comments feature. Now the comments feature I'm told doesn't really work as well in Mac as it does in PC. I use a PC, so I'm not really familiar with how Mac is going to view the comments tab. So just be aware of that little quirk. Use formulas wherever you can. Okay, don't just enter, you, you shouldn't, this is Excel. You shouldn't have your calculator out. You should just put the, the formula right into the cell. That's very, very helpful for a certifier to understand where certain values came from. Okay, so for this example, I'm, I'm showing uh, the framing factor for this wall is gonna be 9.4% because we use the formula at the top of the page inch and a half divided by 16 on center is going to tell us the framing factor, okay? Use formulas wherever you can um, to help the certifier follow your, your thought process, okay? If you're using Design PH, and what I will say, and I didn't really mention this earlier, Design PH is probably gonna have us, the certification is probably gonna cost less using Design PH. Um, it is much quicker to um, to follow to to take our to take our uh, areas takeoffs and window shading factors and all of the information that can be added to Design PH. It's much faster to check all of that uh, in a SketchUp model than it is doing it by hand using marked up prints. Um, but if you're using Design PH, one of the quirks with it is it will only export um, the shading factor as an additional reduction factor. So Design PH is going to account for the horizon shading, for the lateral reveals, and the overhangs all in one factor. Okay, it's basically going to do a solar pathfinder type of calculation for each window. So uh, and it, it can do it at different resolutions. So telling the certifier what that resolution is and tracking that is going to be very, very important. Okay. That will certainly save some time. Another thing that we like to see is, especially in the components tab and in the air or in the R values or U values tab, to gray out the assemblies that aren't being used. Because if they're grayed out, we know that they're not being used and we don't have to spend time trying to track them down, okay? So for this example, this wall assembly in this, uh, in this PHPP has been changed to something else. They've, they changed the detail or they opted to go with a different wall assembly and so uh, I don't need to go through as a certifier and check all of the R values to, with cut sheets and verify the thicknesses and, and do all of that extra work. 
And same thing with the components. If you've got 47 different components in the for Windows and you're only using two, gray the rest of them out so that we don't have to check them. Okay, so again, this is this is a really good method for communicating in your model to the certifier only what they need to check and only what's being accounted for in the model. Okay. One of the things that I've started to do, particularly on larger projects, is create an additional tab. And this additional tab uh, is going to allow us to use the MEP's um, ventilation um, uh, table to calculate additional ventilation um, rates in the additional ventilation tab. And especially when we're early in DD or uh, moving into SD, or I'm sorry, moving into CD, construction documents, when the MEP is going to be changing some flow rates and, and things like that, it's a little bit more cumbersome to do it directly in the additional vent tab. So I found creating an auxiliary calculations tab is going to be the best way to follow that so that you're not messing up moving formulas and, and links around in the additional vent tab. And the other thing that is really useful by doing an additional tab like this is to calculate your domestic hot water lengths and to calculate your VN50 values and to calculate TFA if, if you're not using SketchUp, right? To keep it all in the same workbook where cells can be referenced um, is, is very, very helpful and many times a time saver for the certifier. So creating this extra tab can be, can be very helpful. Okay. Now, one of the other tricks, and I, I hope that people can, can, can understand, can take this and, and start using it with, uh, with all of their projects is when you purchase PHPP, there are, I would say more than half of the tabs are automatically hidden on you, especially if you are using the IP version of SketchUp, or I'm sorry, of PHPP. Um, and one of those tabs that gets hidden is called the check tab. And unhiding the check tab is extremely useful. Okay, the check tab is more of just a dummy check to make sure that you don't have, you're, you're, you didn't miss a decimal, right, by a factor of 10. Um, so the first portion of the check tab is, it's going to tell you where all of the errors are in all of your tabs, okay? So on the verification page, it's gonna say the PHPP hasn't been completely filled out. Um, if you go to the check tab, it'll tell you where all of those errors are. So in this example, what we're seeing is the verification page has one error and that error is saying the cooling demand hasn't been met. So if we go to the cooling pages, we can then use the summer vent tab and the cooling units tab to clear those errors and we're good to go. So check tab is very, very useful in finding out where some errors are in your PHPP. Now, if we continue down the, the, the check tab, you will find the reasons why some of the information on the verification tab is missing. Okay, why, why hasn't PHPP calculated my, I, I think I've inputted everything, why don't I have a heating demand number? Um, and so PHPP check tab will tell you probably why. Okay, same thing with cooling and, uh, and PE and PER. So this is a, a good resource to quickly look at to determine um, why you don't have values yet. And then if we continue to go down, we have a plausibility check, okay? And so this is just gonna make sure that make sure, you know, your roof area and slab areas are relatively close to each other. And the, um, the ventilation rates seem appropriate and you have a circulation pump entered when you're calling for a domestic hot water circulation loop, right? So there are some really 
um, some really good cross checks in the plausibility check portion of the check tab. So certainly take a look at that tab. It's going to be very, very useful for you. And as part of certification, the certifier is going to go through and check the check tab to make sure that all of those items have been cleared or commented on as to why um, certain things are the way that they are. Now, let's talk about, I've got four or five common errors that come up, and then we'll get into some questions, okay? Um, the number one most common error I see is people just link VN50 to the ventilation value, value in, the ver in the ventilation tab. This number, the volume of ventilated space, ventilation volume does not equal probably does not equal the uh, air change rate, your blower door air volume, okay? Almost always the ventilation volume or the VN50 is going to be greater than your ventilation volume. And I say almost always because I'm actually working on a project right now that is a slab on grade eight foot ceiling residential house and According to PHI's protocols, regardless of ceiling height, shorter or taller than eight foot two or eight point two feet, um, you use eight point two feet. So this particular house has eight foot ceilings, and for VN or for uh, is this right? Th these are backwards. I'm sorry. Ventilation volume. Uh oh. Ventilation volume and this is v n i should have had a certifier look at this presentation before i gave it um so ventilation volume equals tfa times 8.2 okay and vn50 is going to be 100 percent tfa times the ceiling height and then we're going to also account for the air volume of stairwells okay very, very important difference. And usually VN50 is going to be greater than ventilation volume. Okay, let me clear these. Okay, another common error is measuring to the outside of the thermal envelope. Okay, so we're talking bottom of slab insulation to top of roof insulation or attic insulation is going to be the height of your walls, okay? So the height of your walls is actually going to include the slab edge and the depth of the roof insulation, okay? Um, and your slab dimensions are going to go to the outside of the thermal envelope for your walls, okay? Um, so again, just making sure that you're measuring to the outside dimensions of the thermal envelope. And then what we can do is account for all of the stuff that's going on in these corners with thermal bridge calculations. So the height of your exterior walls is usually from the bottom of sub slab insulation to the top of the roof insulation. And the area of the roof and your slab are usually from the outside face of the rain screen or to the outside face of the assembly, just depending on if you have a rain screen or not. Whatever is modeled in your areas tab, um, or I'm sorry, in your R values tab. Now this one is a really, really common one, especially if the designer is out of area from where the project is being done. Uh, using the incorrect elevation in the climate tab. So if we look at this current project right now, it's in, it's in Rochester, and we're going to just use the building location uh, as the same height, same elevation as the weather station. And we'll, we're meeting the criteria pretty comfortably, right? We're at under 4.6 and 4.75 is the limit. And oh, whoops, I forgot to change that. And the building elevation is really 750 feet. It's not going to make that big of a difference, right? Well, now we're over our limit. Okay. So super, super important to change the building elevation to the actual build site elevation. I, this, is, this has doomed a few projects. 
And then this one might be one of my favorites. Is this what your PER graph looks like? If you've selected PER as your, as your uh, analysis point, not primary energy, but primary energy renewables. And if your graph looks like this, it's probably because of an entry on the areas tab. So if we go to the areas tab and we look at the building footprint, the projected building footprint input, many times this value, this quantity doesn't get entered when you export from design pH. This quantity doesn't get entered, but this user determined uh, footprint does get imported. So what we need to do is just add a one to the quantity there and that fixes the graph. Okay. Uh, and then another, and I think this is the last one, most common errors is when we're going through the electricity tab. The default values for the electricity tab are going to be the cold water connections for dishwashing and clothes washing. And that might be the case for your project, but in my experience, it's usually not. Usually the dishwasher and the clothes washer have a hot water connection. So we wanna make sure that we're accounting for that with a uh, domestic hot water connection. Okay, um, this is really only gonna impact your PER, but it typically impacts it fairly significantly, um, particularly on a larger project. Okay, um, there is a lot of really good information. Uh, and what I can do is put these links right in the chat or take a screenshot if you, wanna, if you wanna know what these links are. The first one is the building certification guide. What's really nice about the guide is there are examples of sample documents that you can download. Okay, this is what a blower door test report looks like. And this is the information that we need on a blower door test report. Okay, um, so the, the certification guide is very, very useful. The other, um, the other really, helpful document is the building certification criteria document. And that again, can be downloaded from Passive House's uh, uh, PHI's website. And that's about a 25 page uh, checklist of all of the documents that need to be submitted with examples of what those documents should look like. And then lastly, because I screwed it up, this might be something that I need to look at again here is the link between VN or the, the Passapedia link between VN50 and ventilation volume and how to calculate it and how they're different and why they're different. Um, so there's a, a link there for that. And before we open it up for questions, uh, one quick plug tomorrow is our first meeting for Passive House Empire State Chapter of PHN. Um, and uh, myself and two other people, plus Ken, and I, you know, I, I guess five other people, uh, have started this Passive House Empire State Chapter, and our first meeting is next week. And um, so hopefully I get to meet a few more of you um, at that meeting as well. Um, so with that, one, I'm interested in any quirks that anybody else has seen in PHPP that they have caught multiple times and, and how they've figured it out. And if you have some of those quirks, send me an email, please. I would love, I love learning about stuff like that. Um, so that, you know, I, I learn typically more than, than you guys do when I'm giving presentations like this. So if you have any quirks in PHPP, please send them my way. Um, and I can be reached at matt at rockpassivehouse.com or matt at passivehousenetwork.org. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's see what we've got for some, for some comments. Great. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, not a That's problem. A fabulous presentation. I mean, uh, it's so important going in to be well prepared, right? And, um, I think uh, before we dive into some of the comments, um, to just curious, um, you you talked up front uh, about kind of gauging the you know the project in front of you as a certifier and the the designer consultant who's working on it and and what they're going to be presenting. 
Um, I mean, how are you how are you gauging that? I mean, from the, the from the preliminary documents and and or from yeah, just so I mean, really, what we're trying to gauge when we're when we're bidding on a certification project is just how much time is it going to take? How complicated is the building? How what what how complex is the shape? Right? Is right. there forty seven corners? Is there four corners? Um, so that is kind of setting a baseline right there. And then it has to do more with the presentation of the, the uh, any supporting documents that might be submitted. And it's really helpful to send a PHPP. Sometimes it's a little early and the PHPP hasn't really even been brought up yet. Right. Um, and so then it's just a matter of our familiarity with the designer. If we've done multiple projects with a given designer, we already know what to expect and we, we can we can further gauge our time with that. But if this is your first time going through the project or going through a certification project, um, the more information that you can supply, the better. But we do understand that it's early in the process and um, we, want to, we want it to be early in the process. Right. So, I mean, right. So, I mean, we always argue for people to get, go as early as possible in terms of getting a certifier on board. So you, you mm -hmm. don't dig any holes for yourself. Um, and, uh, but from day one, when you're doing the initial programming, do you ever see that where you're just- Yeah, so th that's, that, that is a good point. So there, there have been some projects where we're kind of hired on to coach on an hourly basis with the designer to, to help them bring up the first model, okay? And then once we've gone through some coaching, then what we we're familiar with the project at that point because we've we've helped you through measuring outside dimensions and things like that um so we're more familiar with the project and then can usually give you a better price so it really just depends on how much coaching is needed but we can certainly do some coaching and usually that's on an hourly basis as the designer would want and usually we'll throw a not to exceed clause in that just right. so that you're not blindsided by a $40,000 bill. Right. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, since you're throwing out a number to re sure. reorient people's heads, um, what, what are you seeing with, like what kind of range could you speak so, to for a single family or a... I, I could get in trouble for this. So yeah. for, for a single family house, uh, a really simple single family house, four corners, really good orientation, no horizon shading, done in design pH, um, using all certified products, you're probably looking between $2,500 and $3,000 for certification. Okay. So that's, that's like that, that's what I would call the starting price. And then it can double or triple depending on uh, a variety of factors. Right. Good. That's yeah. nice to know the sense of magnitude. Sure. Um, and uh, um, there was a question in terms of bringing up the detail um, of, of the project. Uh, you, you know, when you're early in schematic design, you may be looking at a bunch of wall assemblies. You're not pricing it yet. Um, what are you doing as a certifier and what should the, the consultants be thinking about in terms of what they're inputting and, and how they're developing it? So usually early in the process, what I like to do is just put a, a generic R value in. Okay. We're going to say, okay, the wall, the exterior walls above grade are an R40 and it's one inch thick, right? That's what we're going to put in the areas tab. One and foot that all, and that all can be modified later, but that'll kind of give the pro give the give the um, give the project a target, right? And so we need to achieve an R forty, including inclusive of all framing factors and things like that. So that's usually where we like to start, and then we can develop actual assemblies from there because the assembly that you're going to have for an R fifty wall is going to be limited. But if you only need an R35, there's there's probably two dozen ways to get about an R35 wall. And so then it's basically up to what the design, what the, the architect is comfortable with 
and what the client is looking for in terms of embodied carbon and right. what the builder is most comfortable actually building and what you can actually p- procure at this time. Right. And, and what about, um, you, I've heard folks talk about having a buffer built in. So you're not designing to 4.75 kilo BTUs from day one. Uh, and wh- how do you, what's the relationship of the buffer to the process and how do you deal with that? So as very, very early in the design phase, um, I like to have about a 12% buffer. So we want to be right around 3.9 kBTU per square foot per year. Okay. And do you do similar with the PEPR and, and cooling? So for a single family house, very, 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 it's not very common that we're going to exceed PER in a, in a single family house. Um, but yeah, usually that early in, into the design, things haven't been selected. Like they don't know if they're going to have a circulating loop for the domestic hot water system. They don't know what kind of water heater they're going to have and what kind of appliances and, and all of that kind of stuff. So usually PER, we're just going to kind of leave until we have a little bit more information. Um, but for heating demand, usually I, I like to see around 3.9, super, super early. And once TFA has been verified and VN50 has been verified, then we can kind of start to bring that number back up a little bit. But because TFA is the bottom half of the equation with, you know, 700 variables at the top half, TFA is going to have the biggest impact on that number. So we want to get TFA verified as early as possible. Great, great. Yeah, I'm always intrigued there, uh, side note, to see projects come in kind of significantly under the limits. Um, and they just, they finish the project that way. Maybe it's because they've got a great blower door number in combination with having a little bit of a buffer. Um, but it seems like you're just baking in uh, better resilience, a better building. Yeah, that, you know, <laughs> you're never going to hear a complaint from a, from a client saying, we're, us- we're not using enough energy. Um, so it's, it's always good to, to have that buffer. And right. there's, there's right. certainly some danger into designing right to 4.75, right? I, right. You know, there, there certainly is some value engineering that, that can happen, but it, there is some danger when you are designing right to 4.75 because thermal bridge calculations come into effect, you know, further on in design and, the landscaper decided that they wanted to plant a tree right in front of the south facing window and now it's slightly shaded and so there, there's a lot of unseen variables that that can occur right there was uh, a question regarding commissioning mm-hmm. uh whether you have third party commissioning uh as part of the certification process and the relationship of that um if you could speak a little bit so there is no action so Having a passive house tradesman, a certified passive house tradesman is very, very helpful, but it's not a requirement for certification. In fact, being a certified designer isn't a requirement for certification. It's highly recommended, right? Um, but it's, it's not required. What is required is the test that we'll say, we'll start with the blower door test, right? Commissioning the building. The, the blower door test is done to um, the EN standard that's required by PHI, okay? So that is the first actual requirement. As a certifier, we review that document. We don't review the credentials of who did it. We review the document that's sent to us. But that's um, by, done by a third party. And so that is done by a third party. Um, we review all of the photos that have been taken throughout the process, again, as a, as a building commissioning um, uh, set up. So the photos are going to commission the building. It's not going to be the, the fact that the, the builder was a passive house certified tradesman. Um, and same with the ventilation system commissioning. Now, it, here in the U.S., there's really only one, there might be two certified ventilation systems. And usually those systems, if you tell the ventilation uh, manufacturer that you're going for passive house certification, they will include a commissioning cost and can supply somebody who does the commissioning for 
those systems to meet the passive house criteria for, for ventilation system commissioning. Yeah, great. Um, it is limited, but there are those few points where you, where you have the commissioning. Um, I guess we're coming up on time. If there are more questions, feel free to put, put them in or raise your hand. I wanted to comment before we ended. I thought it was a great point early on about uh, don't be afraid to say what you don't know um, and question what you do know. That uh, And particularly, the, the CPHD course is, is so critical in terms of getting a foundational uh, and kind of all-encompassing uh, grounding in the knowledge of Passive House and to get it into your blood. But by no means uh, does it then uh, anoint you with um, the powers to know, to know all and be able to go out and do it. I mean, I compare it to graduating from architecture school. When I graduated from architecture school, I would never have conceived that I had the knowledge to actually design and be the architect. You have to go through your apprenticeship. And I think this certification process is really that passive house apprenticeship and, and what, you're, what you're talking about there um, and coming at it like that. And, and to address briefly as well what you were saying, you don't need to, to be a certified tradesperson or a designer. PHI actually you know, encourages folks to get their CPHD accreditation by doing a certified building, by completing a building. Um, but for most of us, uh, it's going to be a much more efficient and cost-effective process and, and a saner process if you have that foundation of knowledge from the CPHD course initially. Uh, so you're not learning everything on the fly um, as you're going through. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, so any other questions? Um, I think I definitely have some ideas for, for diving in deeper dives in different directions. Um, uh, really fascinating stuff, so important. Yeah. So thank you, Matt. This You're welcome. Terrific. It's great and to talk to everyone everybody for... and let me know how I can help on, on some of your projects. And uh, like I said, I hope to, to see you tomorrow at the PHN uh, Empire State meeting. Yes, and we hope to see you at the conference June 10th yes. and then in Boston June 17th. So wonderful. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.